Um, may, may we start, Doug, with um, a bit of a description as to what exactly Advanced Biofuels Canada does in the marketplace? Sure. The, um, we're an industry association representing uh, broadly uh, advanced biofuels, but the, the market's moved along a little bit. So there's also synthetic fuels that are derived from non-biogenic sources like municipal solid waste, and there's ambient CO2 uh, capture from, sorry, CO2 capture from ambient air or from industrial flue stacks that can be synthesized into fuels. Um, so there's a number of different pathways, but but broadly we represent the non-fossil, low carbon, or or what we call clean fuels. And the members that that are part of Advanced Biofuels Canada are in a number of categories. They're either developing technologies to produce these fuels, they're producing uh, or and supplying these fuels today. Um, or they're involved in the distribution of fuels or services and, and technical support to the industry. So the map on the on the screen um, has the uh, the members and and their locations um, of assets in Canada. And broadly, they um, they include a um, a rich set of global leaders. There's over 15 billion liters uh, per year of production capacity amongst the membership group right now. Great, great. And when we look at at the distribution, the current distribution of biofuels. Do you, do you have any sense as, as to how it breaks down between uh, biofuel class? Uh, between the different fuel types? Yes. Uh, I do. In fact, I can, um, here's here's a summary slide of the, of the Canadian market um, as it's described by, by reporting out on regulations uh, up that are current up to the end of 2018, and we provided an estimate to 2019 in this data. This was done by Navius Research. They put out an annual report called Biofuels in Canada. You can find it on their website and, and on Advanced Biofuel Canada's, uh, and the data data in there is is open source. So users are welcome to um, download the, the uh, spreadsheet and see the data in its gory detail. Um, but broadly, what we're using in Canada is over um, 3 billion liters um, of ethanol in the gasoline pool and um, slightly more than 600 million liters in the in the uh, distillate pool and that would be biodiesel and renewable diesel are the are the fuels um, in terms of blending on an aggregate basis across Canada about six and a half percent of our gasoline pool is ethanol content and it's just over two two and a half percent or so um, in the distillate pool is renewable content. Great, great. And and for for our uh, our, our guests who may not be familiar, um, can you describe the difference between biodiesel and renewable diesel? Sure. The uh, they're both alternatives to uh, refined petroleum diesel, which is derived from crude oil, uh, and both are are bio based. And the feedstocks for those are typically oleochemicals, which means vegetable oils, used vegetable oils, or used cooking oil. Um, as well as animal fats, so rendered animal fats, um, tallow and, and uh, white grease, et cetera, can also um, be converted into uh, to dis distillate fuels. What biodiesel does is it essentially takes those feedstocks, mixes in methanol and stirs it up with some catalyst, um, and it creates a fatty acid methyl ester, which is a, a, an additive that can go into the diesel fuel system. And generally it's, it's blended in the range of five to 20% commonly used up to 20% in the US, less commonly in Canada. Typically, it's more at the 5% blend level. And renewable diesel takes those same feedstocks and hydro treats them in, in the same way that a petroleum refinery would, uh, would, would crack the carbon chains with um, hydro treating. And so that, that process produces a, a fuel that is called renewable diesel or sometimes called hydrogenation derived renewable diesel in Canada. And, uh, but it's a very, very similar molecule to diesel. And so it's more fungible. Um, it can be blended at, at any level. Um, and it's used uh, broadly in, in compliance in, in Canada. It has been since about two, 2010 or 11. Great, great. And, 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 you know, I would suspect a lot of the, the viewers today would say uh, that they're somewhat familiar with um, biofuels as an additive. Uh, you know, they've, they're familiar with that. They see that at the pump. Um, they perhaps are familiar with some of the, the large industry players. Can you talk a little bit about uh, where we're at today in terms of the additive requirements for uh, for biofuels across the country? Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to the regulations to to show you the the landscape of of how demand is created. 
Um, but before I get into it, I'll just reference that the, the common blends that you see at the pump are 10% regular and mid-grade gasoline is 10% ethanol. And ethanol, in, in addition to being renewable and low carbon, it's a, uh, it's a great source of octane. It's cheaper than refining gasoline all the way to be premium grade. And so we've seen ethanol um, really penetrate the market above the blend requirements because it's cheaper and it has this octane value. Uh, on the diesel side, the, what the fuel suppliers have typically been doing in the last decade is blending 5% biodiesel in the summer months and bringing in renewable diesel in different blend levels um, in those months as well. And they, they do less blending in the winter months when they're needing to, to um, produce low carbon or sorry, low temperature operability of, of the diesel fuels in the cold yeah. months. Um, but here's the map of, of how demand is created. There's, there's fuel regulations that have really um, been largely adopted since 2010 in both fuel pools. And they, there are two different forms of, of regulation. One's a renewable fuel standard, which requires a minimum blending level of renewable content in, into the refined petroleum product. And you can see that in the, um, in the red uh, numbers there across Canada, all of the provinces from British Columbia to Ontario have adopted renewable fuel standards requiring minimum blend levels. The red is, is on the blend level in the diesel pool, and the blue is the uh, blend level required in the gasoline pool. The, uh, the one province that is in progress on that is Quebec. They, uh, they published in uh, the spring a draft of their proposed regulation, and, uh, and it's expected to complete this year. There's another type of regulation. Oh, sorry. There's also one federally. The federal government adopted a renewable fuel standard in uh, 2010 for gasoline and 2011 for diesel. The other form of regulation is called a low carbon fuel standard. They're also called clean fuel standards, and they are um, they require something different. They require a reduction in the carbon emissions of fuel writ large um, over time, and they tend to that carbon reduction is based on what's called a carbon intensity and it measures the whole life cycle of the fuel both right from the point of oil extraction through to refining and combustion or in the case of biofuels from crop production all the way through to uh, refining biofuels and then and then combusting them so it compares the fuels on an apples to apples basis um, based on their life cycle carbon per unit of uh, energy which is called a megajoule the British Columbia was the was the jurisdiction that that pioneered this in Canada at the, about the same time as California. They brought in their uh, low carbon fuel standard in uh, 2013. It became effective and it required a 10% reduction in carbon intensity by 2020. And then last summer they extended that to 2030, and uh, and increased the requirement to 20%. And okay. what's what's different in these regulations is that uh, it, it's it also allows for electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, switching to compressed natural gas or renewable natural gas as a low carbon alternative of gaseous platforms. But it's all based on, it's all focused on transportation. And it's the biggest development in Canada is, has been the efforts over the last five years by the federal government, <clears throat> excuse me, to, um, to bring in, into force a clean fuel standard. And it's going to regulate the carbon intensity of liquid gasoline and diesel fuels um, to 2030. Great, great. And, and and I think a lot, you know, a lot of us have been watching the clean fuel standard and we've noted uh, that the federal government has repeatedly endorsed the BC uh, low carbon fuel standard as, as the model um, that it would, that essentially it wish it wished to emulate at least to some degree. Can, can you describe generally what we will see from the clean fuel standard that may be different from the existing BC uh, low carbon fuel standard. Sure. The um, uh, there's a bit of breaking news on that too because there was a, a meeting this morning um, of the clean fuel standard stakeholders, which overviewed a change that was was just released earlier this week by the government um, with respect to the scope of the clean fuel standard. So originally, the clean fuel standard on the liquid side was going to uh, regulate gasoline, diesel, kerosene, light fuel oil, and heavy fuel oil. And on uh, on July 12th, they amended that commitment to um, remove the light fuel oil, heavy fuel oil, and uh, kerosene requirements. 
Um, so the regulation now is is focused on gasoline and diesel, which is predominantly used in, in transportation in Canada. There's a little bit of distillate use in, in heat and power applications, um, but, it, but we're really seeing a, regu a regulation that's pointing at, at the transport sector. What's different in the CFS, is our acronym for it, is that um, they've got a, um, a large um, segment of, of credit generation and eligibility that can be created upstream of fuel combustion. So for the oil sands sector and, and um, uh, oil and gas extraction and refining, these reductions in uh, emissions related to those pro that stage of the process um, will create credits that are, are um, eligible to be used for compliance. Like the British Columbia LCFS, uh, the CFS will also uh, um, uh, enable the, the market demand and, and support credit generation from biofuels and other synthetic non-fossil clean fuels. And also like this, this the LCFS structure, they'll allow for fuel switching to EVs, hydrogen, um, and gaseous uh, transport. So it's similar, but not quite the same. Right, right. And, and, and I think when we, when we look at the clean fuel standard, if we can sort of jump over for a minute, um, what, let me ask in terms of that, that breaking news, was there, was there any commentary, any, any kind of indication uh, that our, our viewers may be interested in around uh, the thinking behind uh, dropping those, those other fuels and perhaps whether there's uh, some alternative coming in terms of uh, regulated markets for, for those kinds of fuels? Yeah, short answer is yes. Um, there's a, um, we're basically at the stage where we're trying to analyze tea leaves. Uh, we have a the draft of the regulation published in December last, uh, last year. And at the time they announced that um, or released that draft, um, they also um, reversed their commitment to continue a process to, to regulate gaseous and solid fuels. And so originally the, the clean fuel standard was going to come in stages, but address all physical states, liquid, solid, and gaseous. Now they're focused on liquids. Now they've narrowed the focus down even further to, uh, to really just look at those transport uh, liquid fuels. Um, they did say this morning that there's ongoing analysis around the impact of um, uh, narrowing the scope, as well as the impact of the other federal policies like carbon pricing and the increase now to 2030 um, of the carbon price by $15 a year until it reaches $170 per ton in 2030. Um, other regulations um, have bearing on the sector as well, like um, fuel economy standards, emission standards on vehicles. And then of course they announced a um, uh, zero emission vehicle sales mandate. Um, uh, right. In, by 2035 to be 100%. So there's a, an elimination of the internal combustion engine that has bearing on the transport sector as well. Um, we're going to see when they publish the final draft, um, supposed to be by December, um, maybe impacts if there's an election uh, that delay that, but it's uh, they're signaling that it is not veering too far from where they published in, um, in December of last year and they will define you know any adjustments to the um, carbon intensity reduction target or um, you know any um, changes to the actual uh, regulatory design will be in that final draft great great and, and i think i think doug we've you know we've seen some fits and starts on the clean fuel standard and perhaps uh in the marketplace the capital marketplace um it's been it's been challenging uh, to get that level of confidence and regulatory certainty around uh, both the the implementation of the clean fuel standard generally, and of course, its tenants. Right. So we've seen we've seen some changes. Um, you know, obviously to, to today's announcement is relevant for certain sectors. Um, it, it does seem though that there is enough uh, enough momentum behind the clean fuel standard that it will be. Uh, implemented, uh, whether it's by the end of this year or perhaps sometime soon thereafter. Is it? Do, do you agree with that? Is that is that your assessment as to where we're at? Uh, yes, I do. The um, I think the major um, 
um, advance in the in the recent months was the Conservative Party of Canada um, releasing it, their their new climate plan in April, and uh, within that plan they have now um, signaled a support for uh, a level of carbon pricing and probably you know a system design that might reflect their own um, particular take on how to do it, uh, but they. They have now signaled support for carbon pricing, and they also signaled support for the clean fuel standard. And there, they pointed more um, to the British Columbia model than the, than the CFS model that was uh, um, published by the Liberal government in December. Um, but there's just minor differences between the two. So that political risk has really been addressed now by the two major parties, and that was a real problem for for investment and and growth in our sector was. You know the complexity and the and the protracted and delayed um, uh, style that the the Canadian regulations develop under. It takes a long time to get these things done, uh, but also the political risk. What was going to happen if if when government changes, um, if there's a different uh, approach to climate action? So that's been addressed. We still I've, I threw up a screen a slide here that just shows what our top three issues are right now. That it, um, in evaluating the CFS demand signal and, and then driving investment into Canada into new production capacity and new infrastructure. Um, on the feedstock side, there are, there are new requirements around the sustainability and environmental integrity of feedstocks, and, and they're called land use and biodiversity criteria or LUB criteria. Um, they're important. They will um, help make uh, market participants and, and uh, all stakeholders see the you know the environmental integrity of the system that we're not doing more harm than good, um, but how the system works is to be defined. And there's been a lot of work um, undertaken this year to to try and sort out how provincial regulations, federal regulations, can affirm compliance with Canadian feedstocks and um, and feedstocks from other jurisdictions. The other major issue is is the life cycle assessment model. The federal government's undertaken a brand new model, and um, this is the tool that describes the carbon intensity of your of your fuel and the monetary value of that reduction. And so it's very important and it, it's not visible yet. The work isn't complete. And we're not going to see it until the, the final regulation. And so they've pushed it right up against the, the, you know, the launch of the regulation and the early credit generation period. And there's a huge amount of uncertainty as to um, how closely that model will mirror what we're already using in the market in Canada, which is the GH Genius life cycle assessment model, or the models in the US, typically a variation of the GREET model is used in California and Oregon low carbon fuel standards. And then the third thing is um, what we call a net zero um, uh, um, outcome of the regulation. Because there's a, a strong uh, incentive to um, generate credits upstream in oil and gas where you can reduce your emission in the oil sands by adding CCS or switching um, your your cogen from pet coke to natural gas things like that are um, very important to the oil sand players because it's going to reduce their um, emissions to meet the the tier regulation in Alberta or the federal output based pricing system in addition those same actions will earn them credits under the CFS so they're doubling up and they're stacking the the financial incentive to do those, which are important to uh, emission reductions in the upstream uh, sector, but they don't address 75% of the uh, emissions that happen at the tailpipe. So on a life cycle basis, if you take away all of the reductions uh, that can happen upstream of your, your car or your truck, um, you're still left with 76% of the emissions happening on combustion. That's where we have to uh, be sure we either switch to renewable power or renewable hydrogen or renewable or synthetic fuels in order to drive the emissions down. And so yeah. what, it, what it all adds up to net net is what's the demand signal for clean fuels? That's what we're all trying to figure out. Yeah, yeah. And and in, in respect to that demand signal, um, are, are we, I mean, I think we've heard comments in the industry that uh, with uh, the, the default values around carbon intensity are in and of themselves not sufficiently attractive and, and may or may not be market uh, in North America. Um, and, and so I wonder in, in terms of when, uh, when the marketplace will fully be able to appreciate 
the financial opportunities that the LCA uh, assessment will provide us. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, if, if there's a need for uh, some form of interim communication prior to the commencement date that, that gives the market some some sense of to where these values may be under the tool and, and, and whether there's an opportunity for people to kind of map out and maybe on a pro forma basis, uh, what those opportunities will be instead of otherwise sitting idly waiting until the regulation comes out, which of course will presumably frustrate any kind of early, early compliance activity. Do, do, do you have any thoughts on that? I know it's a packed question. Yeah, we, uh... We've been discussing this this point um, exactly with with Environment Canada for some time, and and all of the players, the obligated parties, the um, supply chain feedstock providers, and the and the low carbon fuel producers are all keenly interested in this. And what we've heard back is that they will uh, establish the stakeholder advisory committee, or what we call the stack um, group, that is an advisory body to to comment on the LCA model when it's released. Um, they'll get that established and and ready to go. Um, after CG2, um, but there, there won't be any pre-release of uh, numbers or information, uh, methodologies, et cetera, uh, until the CG2 publication, uh, but that they will be ready to activate that group and, and get comments back. And, you know, we'll, right. I expect, I expect it'll be what I call a turbulent launch. It's going to, there will be, <laughs> there will be issues with the model. There, there have been in all other markets, um, the federal RFS in the U S the California, BC, LCFS markets, they all had issues with the modeling at the outset that just took time to uh, um, Im improve the model, get more accurate and, and uh, um, uh, verified data into it. Well, well, let me ask you, in terms of the, the rollout, um, do you have any sense as to who, uh, who and where those uh, immediate financial gains will be, where, where the the, the greatest revenue generation may be in terms of uh, using uh, the CFS, and we're presumably talking about the uh, low carbon fuel supply, the the CC2 yeah. mechanism. Do, do you have any sense as to as to which which fuels and which kind of uh, producers of those fuels may be best positioned once once we have a compliance date? Uh, we we do have some uh, assessment of it. We we put it up on our website. Uh, late last year, it was, I believe, at the end of November in 2020, um, some modeling of the CFS system uh, done by a, a fellow who runs a model, a global partial equilibrium model that has all of the, the fossil fuels, gasoline, diesel um, prices and, and trading in the world, as well as agricultural commodities and biofuels. And the, the the detail is not sophisticated enough to um, to take all parameters into account and allow the model to solve. But what what we can do is we can create scenarios where if we say if we have this many credits from electric vehicle generation or this many credits from upstream oil and gas uh, or this many credits that are traded in from the gaseous or solid sector that are allowed into the liquid sector um, or payments into the emission reduction fund, then solve for the biofuels. And, and the modeling is very good at that. And it, what it does is it shows that uh, blending in, in biofuels could go um, up towards 15% in the gasoline pool. It'd be predominantly ethanol, but there'll also be renewable gasoline from co-processing bio crude with fossil crude. Um, and uh, there'll be strong growth in the diesel side. And this is because there's less switching over to electric vehicles and other platforms um, in diesel, pla in diesel uh, transport. And so, Biodiesel use, uh, but predominantly renewable diesel use, and then um, co-processed lower carbon diesel um, fuels will um, will grow significantly over the the period to 2030. Um, and the other aspect of that demand question is is to always keep in mind those provincial regulations. The um, the CFS is providing a signal as to a reduction in carbon intensity. But you have these RFS, um, and in the case of BC, uh, another uh, LCFS uh, signal, which stack, they're, they're nested. You don't have to use two different liters of fuel. You use one liter of fuel to meet your obligation if you're in that province under the federal system as well. And that, that stacking of the signal is um, creating a fundamental baseline of demand for low carbon fuels in the same way that carbon pricing of industrial facilities here in Alberta or 
um, cap and trade in Quebec uh, or the OPPS system, that stacks the carbon signal uh, on industrial facilities with the clean fuel standard as well. So you've got these, the, right. the, the regulations are really becoming um, complementary and, uh, and binding in this decade. We're going to see, uh, you know, significant expansion in pretty much reductions from all, all types. You're going to get the upstream reductions, you'll get the low carbon fuels. And of course, we've now got an intention to mandate um, uh, a ban on internal combustion engines uh, by 2035. That's a whole other um, sector of growth. Right, right. And, and when we talk about biodiesel, I mean, I mean, are we are we seeing existing infrastructure, refineries, and 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 other installations uh, repurposing themselves for the purposes of of uh, blending in, producing, uh, uh, essentially co-producing, and then looking to sort of feed the market uh, from existing facilities? Is is that is that is that part of the shift that we're seeing? Yeah, I'll, I'll come at it a couple of ways. The, um, at the refinery level, you can um, bring in animal fats or vegetable oils um, and co-process them with crude oil. And it's a relatively uh, low capital expense to bring that equipment in and, and uh, be able to process those fuels. Parkland Refinery in, in British Columbia is, has been doing it at 10% or 5%. They're talking about increasing it up to 10%. Um, and the refining capacity in Canada is such that for every 1% of, of bio-based material that goes in, you would produce a billion liters um, of a bio-based gasoline, diesel, um, or jet fuel. And so that's one pathway. Uh, the other thing that is, uh, is emerging and being to be very um, dominant and successful in the, in the U.S. market in particular, and there's some announcements in Canada, is to dedicate a hydro treater at the refiner at the refinery to processing those same feedstocks and then essentially what you've got is you've got a parallel system at your refinery that's doing uh, renewable diesel and some of the lighter uh, cuts uh, that come out of the hydro treater and that again is a, is another supply point for um, for these low carbon intensity fuels in addition to that You've got the traditional biodiesel plants that, that produce the fatty acid methyl ester, and the renewable diesel plants that are standalone. And there's a no, there's a number of uh, announcements uh, um, of those in Canada as well. And there's been strong growth in the U.S. on the refinery side, um, as well as the dedicated standalone renewable diesel side. Wow, and 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 in terms of the the the, the generation of of credits, the, you know, the, in the marketplace, I think we're hearing those who wish to be new suppliers under the CFS, um, you know, very much interested in, in um, building out in advance of a 2022 compliance date with an expectation that there'll be a, a vibrant credit market. Um, and, but at the same time, I mean, you, you've mentioned this um, uh, already, that there is a mechanism, a, a CC1 mechanism that allows for uh, life cycle improvements uh, for uh, primary suppliers, producers uh, of oil and gas. And I'm wondering if you can comment a bit on uh, whether the that in, the initial compliance stage may be uh, the opportunity may be subsumed within those life cycle improvements. And if so, when when the window will likely really open in terms of uh, you know expansive growth in the, the CC2, the low carbon fuel supply market. Do, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to share some. The um, ECCC did a, um, a regulatory impact assessment study that published at the same time as the draft regulation. And this is their data on the slide here that shows how the, the credit growth um, that they modeled for the, for an analysis. It's not a forecast. Again, it's it's more like a scenario that says if this is the market, then we would expect um, the credits to come from these locations. And the top line, the green line, is uh, low carbon fuels. So essentially biofuels, and then over the decade, we'll see more of these synthetic fuels. The the next line down, the gray line, are these emission reductions uh, that come from upstream uh, compliance category one or CC1 is the acronym there. And then the, the blue dash line is um, uh, electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles or, or renewable natural gas powered transport. And 
the bottom line, you can ignore. It was just sort of a placeholder that Environment Canada said, we'll put a question mark on things that we can't see yet, we'll call them emergent technologies. And by, you know, by 2040, we scale them out. But really, it's the top three lines. And Environment Canada's modeling matches the, um, the global um, partial equilibrium modeling that we did in that it says really not much of a, uh, an impact on markets until 2025 or 26. That's partly because these these provincial standards are uh, already in place and they're they're ahead of the of the requirement that will be in the CFS, um, and we're also going to see a, a bit of a delay in build out. If you started a, a project today, it would take three four years um, to get to commissioning. A lot of the projects are advanced, but they're they're advanced at the engineering and the permitting stages. They're not uh, there's not a lot of steel in the ground. Um, with the exception of a couple of projects in Canada. So we're going to, yeah, it'll be a slow start until 2025, 2026, and then we'll we'll start to see some um, greater activity in the credit generation market. And probably, I, I think the CFS will be long credits. We're not going to see the credit price signal that we see in British Columbia and California because their regulations are far more restrictive in terms of allowing outside credits to be generated in gas and solid or in the upstream sector. And so, and they're also further along in terms of the carbon intensity reduction requirement than where um, where the CFS will start in 2022. So that, that'll give us a bit of a different signal um, at the federal level for the, for the CFS market. And, and I think, you know, I, and I, I mean, I think that's that's right. That's the sense in the marketplace that between perhaps 2025 and 2030, there'll be a, an explosive growth in uh, in biofuel biofuels in the marketplace. In other words, uh, once all that buildup has happened, um, are, are you seeing anything around the primary suppliers being interested in participating, whether it's as investor, sponsor in some fashion, uh, financier? Uh, in re in respect of new uh, biofuel suppliers and, and new projects, are, are we seeing them kind of cross the floor and and looking to participate on the generation side in terms of that CC2 opportunity? Uh, absolutely. The um, uh, the ones that are uh, producing biofuels right now are Husky in, uh, at the Lloyd Mincer refinery has an ethanol uh, production plant there. And they've also got a carbon capture and storage um, unit attached to that. So they make low carbon ethanol. Uh, they've got another plant in, in Manitoba. Suncor's got a couple of big um, uh, trains at their uh, at their uh, Sarnia refinery that do uh, corn based ethanol. And so they're already in the market. Federated Co-op um, bought a, a smaller ethanol production facility, I believe a year or so ago, uh, maybe two years ago now. Um, and they also were recently in the media this spring um, uh, with, a st with, a, with the purchase of the True North uh, Renewable Diesel Project Assets. So they're looking at a, uh, a renewable diesel component to their, to their refining complex in Regina. Um, in addition to that, Suncor um, uh, made some comments that were speculating about their they're well, not speculating, saying that they were looking at the opportunity on renewable uh, fuel side at, at their Montreal um, refinery. And Shell and Suncor are, uh, are both co-investors with Intercam uh, in, the, uh, in the new build um, municipal solid waste and, and uh, uh, biomass uh, based um, ethanol production facility in Varennes, Quebec. And right, then right. going all the way out to Newfoundland, um, the the private equity firm that has been negotiating to purchase the Come By Chance Refinery, which is, um, you know, has been in receivership for about a year now, um, has talked about converting that entire facility um, to bio-based uh, feedstocks and essentially doing what the what the U.S. sector is is doing um, in a very active state um, is converting to um, to be to make renewable diesel and and other cuts and. Um, Back to BC, both Tidewater, which uh, which bought the old uh, Husky refinery in Prince George, and Parkland, which 
bought the uh, the former Chevron refinery in Port Moody. Um, they're both funded and uh, supported by the British Columbia under the Part Three Agreement uh, structure uh, to develop renewable diesel and and co-processing, expand the co-processing in the case of Parkland, but develop co-processing uh, in in Prince George um, at those two refineries. So yeah, the refining sector is very active, and they've got they've got a strong opportunity. They uh, um, they've, they own the infrastructure and the assets to move fuels to market. And, and so, you know, making, making lower carbon molecules, um, at their facilities, or at least blend, bringing them in and blending them at their, uh, their wholesale terminals. That's, um, that's how the, to most cost effectively move these fuels into the market. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could eat, I mean, it's a spectacular growth in terms of the, uh, the investment, the interest, um. Yeah, and we haven't even, uh, you know, we've only, we've talked about biofuels. Obviously, there are other alternative fuels out there as well that also are garnering quite a lot of interest. Um, yeah, I, I wonder think, if we. Can... I, I, I think one of the one of the sleepers there is is electric vehicles, and the um, the the modeling by Environment Canada has um, reflected that by 2030 there would be three million credits coming from uh, fuel switching, which they attribute to the light duty um, electric vehicle. Uh, fleet, that is a is a significant underestimate of uh, what will be happening by 2030. We do have ZEV mandates already in place in Quebec and British Columbia. Um, that's on the light duty side, but there's also electric buses that the federal government's putting a lot of support into um, that'll be adopted by municipalities and, and uh, cities, and and then medium and heavy duty transport where possible. They'll be switching. Um, by the end of this decade over to electric vehicles. And some of the modeling that Navius did in 2019, I believe, um, demonstrated that it was, you know, it was very plausible that electric vehicle uh, credit generation could, could rise as high as 15 million credits by, um, by 2030. And the, you know, the total demand for credits in the CFS system is somewhere in the order of magnitude of 28 million credits per year. Um, by 2030, so that's a significant chunk. And if you if if you marry that up with the the CCS projects that have been announced in Alberta, um, that are that are already in place, uh, and the other opportunities to reduce emissions upstream in the oil sands, that's another 15 or 20 million credits. So that that's that's how I get to to my comment that suggests that the credit market in the CFS will be will be long credits as as they're currently proposing it. I want to talk a bit about money uh, and specifically around funding opportunities uh, for developers. Um, what we're seeing, we, we had a budget, a, pr a pretty spectacular budget, I think, uh, in the the sort of green uh, clean tech space more generally, as well as obviously specific to uh, technologies such as biofuels technologies. Um, I wonder if you can talk a bit about what's out there, wh where the opportunities are, where we're seeing success in accessing those those opportunities, whether it's on the the funding side or on the tax side. Yeah, um, you're right. It was the um, uh, there's sort of two um, two legs to to the announcements from the federal government on this. One was the the strength and climate plan release in December, um, which started to pencil out. I think there were 64 different measures um, representing over 17 billion dollars of um, commitments to. Um, climate action um, through through funding that would would mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, and then in addition, in, in budget 21 in April, um, they shored that up by um, putting additional funding in in some cases uh, or penciling out details in um, in the budget in the budget bill. Um, so I've, on this slide, I've got a, a summary of the key ones. The Clean Fuel Fund has now launched. It, it was launched in June. Um, there's a single window application. It's good until it's it, which is open until um, late in September, um, and it, that's really targeting uh, production capacity of clean fuels that are in an advanced stage. You got to have your engineering, your blend, your um, your business model uh, well advanced in order to. Um, win the race to be one of the top projects to be funded there. There's also a large fund called the Net Zero Accelerator, which is a is targeting emission reductions by large funnel emitter, which emitters, which includes the refining sector and the upstream sector. So we'll see some funding driven out our sector, I assume, through that. Um, and then there's some dedicated funds in, in agriculture and forestry that um, 
uh, are also directed at climate action, so could possibly support the sector. Um, there are two others that, that were added. Um, they were originally part of the, the Liberal platform in the last election. Um, they ended up on, on Deputy Prime Minister, Finance Minister Friedland's desk as part of her mandate in, in January of this year um, to advance, and we saw them in the budget. And that's one is called the Zero Emission Technology Manufacturers Tax Cut. It's a 50% reduction in the federal tax cut um, that applies to a range of clean, clean energy or clean fuel uh, activities. And what they did in the budget is they narrowed it to only apply to specified waste materials. And, and uh, um, that's problematic. I'll come back to it in a second. The other, the other major tax piece is, is to allow for accelerated depreciation. So 100% write off of your, of your CCA in the, in the first year. And that's been applied to clean manufacturing, and they've also um, enabled it under the, the flow through provisions of 43.1, 43.2 for um, those classes of assets to um, flow through the expenses to investors. Those, both of those tax measures, I think, are very important for, for financing and investment and being able to um, pencil out your, your project returns um, with a level of certainty uh, as to the, to the market conditions, at least from the tax part. And that these measures are proposed to go out in the case of CCA for at least five years, in the case of the ZETM uh, for about 10 years, which is important because it takes that long to finance, build, and then, you know, it'll, it'll, um, getting access, accessing these um, measures is, is going to be limited to the latter part of those years. Um, the, the reason I, I said that the, the specified waste material aspect is, is problematic and it applies both on the CCA as well as the tax cut is they've narrowed it down to um, uh, animal fats, used cooking oil, uh, and bio-based uh, crudes from these development stage uh, technologies. And the, the commercial production of those materials in Canada is limited and sold out. We only make so many anim animal, so many tons of animal fat per year related right. to our harvesting of livestock. Um, used cooking oil, Canada, it doesn't have much of a population. There's not a lot of that around. And, and what we what we have today in Canada is already dedicated to renewable diesel production, partly in Canada through co-processing, but, but also moving out to Southeast Asia and to the US. So where we can build commercial commercial scale facilities is based on our vegetable oil um, and corn uh, production, where we've got the ability to scale, and those markets are already um, established and, and export oriented. So we could put more value add by utilizing them in Canada, and then over the course of the decade, if we've got these production facilities established, we can then draw in these um, the the advanced and the and the development stage ones that are bio-based crudes that come from forest residues, ag residues waste materials, and, uh, and we'll be able to um, feather them into the refining uh, complex and the demand signal. But you couldn't build a, you know, a large commercial scale facility today um, based on those feedstocks because they're not, they're not at that scale yet. Wow. Wow. Oh, the, the, those are great comments, man. I know, I know that our, our viewers are obviously interested in understanding the funding opportunities, understanding the tax implications as well as really understanding the market, um, both yeah. where we are today and where we'll be till 2030. And I think you've addressed all those things uh, in, in, in a fulsome way. And obviously the, the slides in addition, I think are a helpful, uh, helpful tool to, to sort of bring things to, uh, to a point. So I'm gonna thank you very much. Uh, for, sorry, uh, one last comment, please do. Yeah, I was just going to add. I, I, did, I didn't mention the provinces, but um, project developers will be aware that the, the you know wherever they've chosen to locate their project, um, that most of the provinces are very active in the in the same space. And so, British Columbia is is implementing a five hundred million dollars strategic investment fund. It's a brand new approach to um, uh, stim clean energy and and stimulus in BC that goes live in September. Um, Alberta has all has long had a uh, a fund that comes from the carbon taxation on in industrial facilities, and they redirect it back through emission reductions, Alberta, and different tier funding programs. Um, they're also um, looking at these uh, upstream reductions, hydrogen strategy, et cetera. Um, 
and and other provinces as well. I think uh, Quebec in in particular has a yeah. production credit program that goes um, directly to producers of low carbon fuels. So and and provinces tend to be very um, responsive to the economic interests, obviously within their boundaries. And so it's a it's an opportunity. All the all the project developers should be engaging either through their industry association or directly with their governments to. Uh, um, explain to them what the opportunities are that they're pursuing. Yeah, and and as you said earlier, you can stack these opportunities. Uh, yeah. uh, so I mean, that's obviously relevant in terms of bringing that final price down to something that's fundable. Um, yeah. Well, great, 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 Doug. Thank you very much for your your participation today. Excellent comments. Great presentation.